So hi. Hey, how are you? you? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it. It's shoot. Oh yeah? How'd that go? It was really fun. Um, she came this morning and she said, I want something with fake blood. And I was like, I don't even have any fake blood. So we made fake blood out of maple syrup, chocolate milk mix, and food coloring. And oh, then wow. we poured blood all over her butt and got all spooky <laughs> with it. Nice. It kind of surprised me you didn't have some already. I did. That's what I said, too. I actually have, like, a drawer um, underneath my makeup station where I usually have gallons of fake blood just ready for me that <laughs> See, I apparently didn't that have any. more right. <laughs> I know, right? It's like, weird. Not a fake blood in sight. Hell <laughs> yeah. So today we're talking to Mackenzie Strange, and she has been a photographer for a long time now. How, how long have you been doing it? I've been paid for photography for 14 years. 14 years now? And would you say that it's predominantly been uh, wedding photography and boudoir through your career? So yeah, for a little bit it was family. But family too? Mainly, mainly nudes and weddings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now she's, she's had this shop. Uh, but it's uh, closing, um, but it's been... We're almost <laughs> done. It's been cool to see its growth in the time that it's been around and uh, the cool things that she's been able to do with that. Can you tell me like how you got started in photography like yeah. before you were even getting paid? So uh, my dad was a painter and I always loved photos and he always shit on me. He was always like, the way that you take a photo is the way the world sees things and the way that painters paint is the way that they see things. And I was like, I so dramatically disagree with that statement. Like, I feel like photos are always the way that I see it. You know, it's like real time, especially like with editing and stuff. And that was at around like age like eight, I think. My mom had a small camera. Um, so I started using that, and then there was a lady at the church that I went to who was a wedding photographer, and she found out that I was interested in photography, and so she asked me to come to one wedding with her to carry her bags. Nothing more. Uh, and this was at 12. And then that summer, I became her full-time second shooter oh, wow. using her equipment, and I became her full-time editor for the summer as well. She taught me how to edit using Lightroom, and I just started editing for her, and I got paid 50 cents per photo. Nice. Uh, but when you do 1,000 photos for a wedding, that's a shit ton. Maybe it was 25 cents. Either way, it was really cool money for, like, a teenager to make. And then I did that again with her next year at 13. And then um, through school, I was always into, like, art and stuff. And so um, we would take reference photos for drawing class. And I just loved the reference photo part a lot. And so I just kept doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I used to, like, make my friends uh, get dressed up in super stupid outfits and go take photo shoots with me with my stupid little pink camera. And <laughs> it was really cool. Yeah, so it just kind of grew from there. Yeah, you've always had the artist spirit. Yeah. And, uh, I, I remember when uh, <laughs> there was a zombie walk thing, and yeah, uh, you, you did me all up with uh, zombie makeup and a big rip on my arm. Yeah, and, that was uh, so much fun. Like, we used to do special pictures. effects makeup. Oh my gosh, I, those pictures are hilarious. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, it's uh, crazy. That's awesome. I almost but forgot it was about really that. really good for... Especially for teenagers. Yeah. Like... Yeah. Like, I, and I think you had said at the time that was your first time doing something like that. I think it so, was. At least the full, like, rip down the arm yeah. type deal. For a while, I thought that uh, makeup and especially, like, special effects makeup was what I was going to go into. And photography was always, like, this, like, thing on the back burner for me. It was always, like, this thing that I like to do. Um, but obviously, like, you can't make a career out of photography, you know? <laughs> like, you can't be that professionally. So I thought that Proved I would yourself wrong there. Yeah, right? <laughs> Big old womp there. <laughs> So what was the the hardest part about getting started, would you say? That's a loaded question. I think one thing that's really hard is, like, getting your name out there. I think that that's always really hard, but also, like, dealing with imposter syndrome. Um, looking at yourself and, like, all the other artists in the whole wide world and being like, well, who am I compared to all of these people? And, like, learning to get out of my own head about putting myself out there, I think that that was the biggest hurdle to overcome. Interesting, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't even think about how... Uh, the imposter syndrome can can make it difficult. Oh, yeah. 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 It's hard when, you know, there's a million photographers out there, and they're all amazing, but art, it's it's not like sports where, like, you get to be the best, and, like, there's proof that you're the best. As an artist, you just have to create and kind of, like, have a hope and a prayer that someone else likes your art as much as you do. Yeah, definitely. So. And uh, along those same lines, you've always been re very collaborative and yeah. uh, worked with a lot of other very talented people and yeah. 
uh, helps everybody grow together in a way. Yeah, I think that I've always, uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> you know how I was in high school. Uh, definitely a loud, extroverted person. Like, I just love making friends, but I've always been really fucking weird. And I think that when you're so weird, you attract other weirdos. And I think all of our weird has, like, meshed together really well. Like, most of my best friends are photographers, uh, even, like, local boudoir photographers. I actually just had a, a hangout this weekend with me and two other photographers, just hanging out, being friends, and like all shooting together, and it's really cool. What would you say is the most unexpected thing about uh, getting into this career? Oh. Is there any big surprises that, as a kid, you didn't think would really come into play, but as you've gotten into it? I feel like what I'm going to say is going to sound like really almost like taboo and kind of like flexy, but there's a lot of money to be made in this career. Like you can make doctor money in your 20s uh, just taking pictures. And I think that that's something most people don't get. Like when I met my husband, I was 23 and I made $75,000 that year. And he was so caught off guard by that. Like just the fact that you can actually make like real human money. And then I mean, we've made a lot more since then, so. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, in the same way though, it's, it's not something that's necessarily easy to just make that kind of money. Not at you, all. You've yeah. definitely got a, kind of a business mindset. Yeah. And I don't know if it's been completely intentional, but you've had a game plan playing out, it seems like. Yeah. Whether or not it's, it's just falling into place or whether or not yeah. has that been like a five-year plan you've kind of set out? Or? So when I made my five-year plan, I did crush it in two years. And that was the coolest fuck moment for nice. me. And then I had to like restructure what a five-year plan really looks like and not just have it be like goals, 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 and have it be more like stepping block, stepping block, stepping block. And that made it easier for me to have a real five-year plan, not just, I want to make this many dollars and do this many shoots. But you know, I have a Facebook group and the Facebook group just started as a place to share pictures of butts. That's all I wanted. And that was like... That was something that I don't think was necessarily ever planned or supposed to happen, and it kind of exploded. We went from 100 members on day one to 5,000 members by the end of the first week. That's luck. <laughs> That's genuinely, like, that is a lucky break. And then from there, it was like, well, now I have this community, and how do I speak to these people, and what do I want to give them? And that's when I had to create the plan for it, because it kind of just created itself, and then I had to build from something that was already made. Does that make sense? Yeah, that definitely yeah. makes sense, but... I almost feel like you're being too humble, because... Uh, <laughs> oh, God. I don't know. It's weird. I'm, uh, <laughs> like, I, I don't think you could have grown to 5,000 and, and beyond yeah. that w without having that mindset kind of already playing out and I, interacting in such ways with the people as they're coming and the people who are there. And you, you built a community, yeah. for sure. It wasn't just a group that you shared pictures. It was well, like a... I do have to say, though, like, I think the only reason it hit there for me personally was because, like... Those first hundred people were like people that they were like my friends, you know, and I feel like something that happened was I was just like myself to these people and they were like, oh, more people should know about her. Um, like I have weirdly become my own brand, yeah. which is real weird and real cool. Uh, it's something that I'm thankful for, but I don't know, it's weird. I feel like I'm flexing and that's like never the goal. Like. Anybody can do it. You don't have to be some weird fucking extrovert like me, but it definitely did, like, just create because of who I am, and that's cool. Yeah, definitely. It's like I'm talking in circles. <laughs> no, <laughs> Gets awesome. nervous on a podcast. <laughs> no, that's a great answer. Aside from the, the financial aspect of things, I guess what's the biggest lesson that you've taken away from from doing this for so long? Do you have any, yeah. any major takeaways? Okay, so uh, trigger warning for anybody who's listening, because um, this story is going to just like talk a little bit about like sexual assault and being a woman. Um, I'm not going to get super deep into it or the details, but uh, you know, being a woman, I had uh, parts of my sexuality ripped from me at different points in life. And when I started doing boudoir, um, the biggest thing that I noticed was every single woman and several of the men who have come to me for my shoots have at some point in their lives had something happen that has made their sexuality strange for them. Whether it was an assault or religion or whatever it is, a lot of us have skewed views of our bodies um, and like especially in sex ways um, for different reasons. And so I've been able to use photography to help other people um, just like reintroduce themselves to their bodies and like start to like grow a new sexual journey within themselves through photos. And I think that that is something that is hands down the most rewarding part of my career. Uh, something I talk about is when, when I was assaulted, I was in my favorite pair of socks and I set them on fire. 
and uh, for two years straight, I didn't wear socks at all, um, still barefoot, um, but now I feel like it is my way of buying everybody socks. That's what I get to do every day, and so I think it's a, a really cool part of the career and also like a really horrible part of the career, but I'm really thankful that it's something I got to take on. Yeah, that's, that's powerful. Yeah, it is. It's really nice to like watch people grow. You know, most people, when they see their new bodies, it's, it's a... It's an experience that we have to have as humans, and a lot of it is tainted by other people's views or just the way that we were raised. And you know, there's so much that has harmed us that I think that having somebody just like genuinely empower your naked body isn't something we often get, and it's something that carries with us for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, along the same lines, do you have any uh, advice or? methods that makes it easier for people who are coming to you for the first time and haven't like been naked in front of somebody who's <laughs> doing pictures and stuff like yeah. that. I'm sure you get a lot um, of first timers. I think the first thing that we always do is just set boundaries. So, you know, if you came into a shoot and your boundary is you absolutely do not want to get naked today, you have no desire for your nipples or your butt cheeks to show, just like, like I always set that boundary with my client, but in general for anybody listening, like setting that boundary first is the best way to do it. If you set the boundary from the start, like I actually kind of want to go spicy today. I really want like implied masturbation photos or like I really want nipple photos. Like when you set that firm boundary and you say like, this is how far I'm willing to go, from the beginning, um, then you're able to be like, all right, this is the goal that we have set today. Um, and then just take your time with it. You know, when I do full nude shoots, we always start in the most clothes and then we slowly undress throughout the whole shoot. That way, like by the time I'm like, all right, you still ready to take your top off? It's like, yeah, I'm super ready and I'm already down to just the bare bones anyways, so let's go for it. Yeah. yeah just taking it slow, setting uh, boundaries. <laughs> is that kind of how you handled it when you first started interacting with people naked or was that? Man. I really didn't know what I was doing. I have to be super honest. I've always been a huge person for like boundaries and consent. I think those two things are super important, um, especially as a photographer, as soon as I got into boudoir. Um, you know, I was experimenting with friends. That sounds different. <laughs> um, but I was it's like experimenting with people that I knew. And so we would sit down and we would talk like, all right, what are our goals today? What are we doing? I have no fucking clue what I'm doing. Do you know what you're doing? And they also wouldn't know what they were doing. So we would just kind of, go for it and see like, is this comfortable for you or is this comfortable for me? Uh, and then when I did my first ever round of like marathon sessions, I booked 18 clients and we were supposed to do them over a span of two weeks. But the studio that we rented, we could only do it in one weekend. So I had 18 people back to back to back and I didn't know any of these motherfuckers. They were all great and it was awesome, but it was like back to back to back to back. All these people were like, oh, hey, by the way, I want to get naked. And I was just like, all right, let's do this. I don't know what I'm doing. So I kind of yeah. flopped myself into it on accident. Do you think that it's it's good to throw yourself into it, kind of? Or was that overwhelming? With proper <laughs> um, etiquette learned, absolutely. I think it was easy for me being like a, a hyper-consensual person, absolutely. I think that I'm the kind of person, like, the second you show up, I'm like, all right, are you going to get naked today? Or are we staying in one outfit? What are you thinking? Um, and, like, having that communication, like that's something I'm just really good at. I think for anybody else, by all means, as long as you're willing to learn a lot about communication before you jump into it, hell yeah, throw yourself with the wolves. It's so fun. Right. <laughs> yeah, you grow really fast. <laughs> what are the differences between photographing a, a man versus a woman? Or um, uh, in between? Or? <laughs> so I think that it's not as different as we think it's gonna be. What I expected, I thought that, and this is like my own prejudice and like my own uh, projections, I think. I think that in my head, I thought men want to look big and tough and women want to look small and frail. And then I had to like circle back and unlearn that because everybody is different and everybody wants to see themselves as like the form of them that is empowered. And that means something different to every single person. To assume that every man that walks in wants to look macho and tough is just as shitty as assuming that every woman that walks in wants to look skinny. Um, and so I think that it's just about the person, you know, I think yeah. that one big thing that's different with like men versus women is men don't have boobs. And so I don't have to like awkwardly cover your nipples all the time. And that's cool as fuck. But outside of that, um, not a ton for how I shoot. There are people that specialize in male boudoir and I'm sure they would have totally different answers, but 
Yeah. For me, I think it's it's just about like viewing each person as a person. Yeah, that's a great answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Is there a a photo shoot that you've had that something's gone wrong, and how did you handle that? So I shot weddings for so long that I'm trying to think of like wedding horror stories that don't like make anyone sound bad. Um, yeah, let me think. I know that there's always like when I was dealing with kids, there's always been like the heathen child who's just throwing a fit that day. Um, but you know, as a photographer, I think that's something you just kind of get used to, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh man, has anything ever gone super wrong? I had a wedding officiant almost not show up one time. Oh, okay. No, I got the best answer. Uh, so I'm an ordained minister. I opened a tattoo shop on Halloween day. Not this last Halloween, but the Halloween before it. That night, my dumbass threw a Halloween party. And she got a little fucked up. <laughs> and I was up until 3 o'clock in the morning, which is super irresponsible. And if you're listening to this gang, I know. You can come at me later. It's fine. <laughs> Um, and the next day we had hosted a day of weddings and oh, wow. we married 14 couples Jeez. starting at 10 o'clock in the morning. So I had to be there at 8am to start setting up. And I had a text message come through that night that one of our wedding officiants, and this was early in the day, um, they had gotten sick and so they weren't able to come, but it was okay. Cause I had my backup one already ready to go. And at three o'clock in the morning, my drunk ass stumbles into bed, like regretting my decisions to stay up that late when I get a phone call from my other wedding officiant, and she came down with COVID. Oh, no. And it came on really fast. At, like, she woke up at midnight feeling a little sick, slept it off a little bit, woke up sick as fuck, called me, and I was just like, what the fuck do I do now? I had a wedding to, it was seven hours away. 14 people were coming to get married, and I was the person in charge of all of it. And so I, um, I got ordained online. <laughs> that way, if anything else, I could at least sign the papers. I knew that I had that. And I started writing out what I was going to say for weddings for 14 people. <laughs> wow. um, and then thankfully, uh, Kendra Reed had pulled through, who is a local wedding officiant. Um, I messaged her on Facebook screaming like, if you are free, please call me immediately as soon as you wake up. And about five o'clock in the morning, she called me. And then another person, whose name is escaping me. He's amazing and a gem, and I know his name starts with an R, but I cannot place it. Uh, so I feel like an asshole. I love you, I promise. He was contacted from the original officiant to cover their spot, so these two people came and really, really made it what it was, and I'm super thankful for it, but I think that was the scariest moment of my whole fucking life. But now I'm ordained, y'all, so I can get you married. Hell yeah. Yeah, I think that was the worst thing, hands down. And I was so drunk. It sounds stressful. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, it all worked out. Even if everything goes perfectly to plan, having 14, 14 people getting married people, in one day is crazy. Eight, that'd be 28 people. Yeah, yeah that's 28 that's people nice. and then their families, and it was crazy. <laughs> uh, it ended up snowing. The heat didn't work at the place we got married <laughs> at, but we had a blast. There was so many people that came together for a really good thing. Yeah, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Oh, right. it absolutely <laughs> did. Every single thing. But it was gorgeous, so it was yeah, fine. Awesome. You didn't see all the sweat behind the scenes. <laughs> Good answer. So how else has the, the pandemic and all that impacted your career? In a lot of ways. So obviously, you know, there was a time where I couldn't shoot. I couldn't meet people. And so I did FaceTime photo shoots with people. Yeah. And I, I was terrified. Like, I'm the breadwinner. My husband was not really working much at all at that point. And it was so scary. We had <laughs> we just paid off all of our debt two weeks before lockdown, um, which meant I drained my fucking savings account, you know? Uh, we wanted to be adults and fucked up. So I did photo shoots through FaceTime with people and they were only $100. And usually my shoots are obviously a lot more than that. And so I actually got to meet 100 people in one month and hold it together real hard and like save up. So that was what we did for the two months that I was legally unable to shoot in person. Um, I just FaceTimed people a lot of people for two months straight, and that was really cool. Um, from there, I don't know if my business has been as affected from the pandemic as a lot of people, um, just because um, I feel like my business kind of coincided with like the tattoo world, where all of a sudden you have all these people that you're rescheduling from you know, the month that you were booked for sessions before lockdown happened, and then it kind of like created this cycle 
where we're all starting to book out further in advance and people are starting to set appointments. Like there's less availability for a lot of different forms of artists. So I have become really booked out, which I think is cool. Um, And I've given myself a lot of uh, availability for rescheduling. I've learned to like really uh, be compassionate with illness, I think, and just like extra careful. Obviously, you know, now we also know, like, UV sanitizing procedures and shit that we never thought we would have to know. Yeah, it's crazy. But, yeah, the FaceTime photo shoots kept me busy. And I think that's the weirdest thing ever. Like, just, it was so cool. It turned out cool, though, yeah. Yeah, it was really fun. Uh, What advice would you give to uh, photographers who are getting started? Um, a lot of it. Uh, First off... If you're just shooting something that isn't boudoir, it's going to be a totally different answer than shooting boudoir. Um, but when it comes to people that are just, like, learning photography, like, just do it. Really, truly commit to it. Go have fun. Take weird pictures. Take horrible pictures. Um, take a lot of self-portraits. Like, you owe nobody good art at all. Um, and now when we go into boudoir, totally different worlds. Um, I just think it's really important to, like, learn your own insecurities and your own triggers and learn how to not project those on other people. Um, you know, we deal in a really intimate space with human bodies and we need to remember that like we are allowed to take up space. And I think that's something a lot of us have had to unlearn to grow in our career. And so I think that, you know, getting your own self-esteem and mental health in check is the best way to flourish. And also you don't have to shoot weddings. (laughs) Just throwing that out there. I know they're awful. No offense, your wedding was fine. <laughs> oh yeah, she shot my wedding. <laughs> when, I was thinking, when you asked like if anything happened about weddings, I was like, what happened at sex wedding? Did you, you guys didn't have anything catastrophic happen, did you? I, I don't think so. I uh, feel like you had the chillest wedding, actually. Yeah, it was, it was pretty normal. I mean, your wife was stunning. <laughs> the place was perfect. It was like a really normal day. Yeah, it, it, was, it was really cool. And you had a lot of uh, good ways to make the pictures natural and... Uh, uh, I don't know if you want to, if that's proprietary. <laughs> oh, it's proprietary, but, like secret, <laughs> secret information. Yeah. Yeah, so something that I do, uh, I do prompts for my couples. Um, in boudoir, I do a little prompt, not as much. I do this one awful thing in boudoir where I like try to get you to fake laugh. All right, we're going to practice it real quick, okay? <laughs> oh, no. So I want you to match my energy, okay? okay. I'm going to laugh. I need you to laugh with me, right? I'm going to go, <laughs> And that's what I do to get people to laugh. <laughs> Because it works, then, it works right? Because then we're just like this fucking idiot. Um, I don't do that at weddings because that would be a little distracting. But for couples, I like to have them do stupid stuff like put your noses together, but like do it in slow motion. And every time your noses touch, go pew 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 because everybody giggles at that. And then you guys are just laughing, having a good time. And just like making it fun is way cooler for me because I cannot pose you guys and tell you like <laughs> act natural while I take a thousand pictures of you. <laughs> right. So, yeah. The witch cackle gets him every time. We tell you what. <laughs> that does it. Um, can we talk a little bit about how your photography business uh, transitioned into the shop and the tattoos? And- yeah, absolutely. So, um, I had a tattoo shop. I have stepped away and I had a lingerie store slash sex shop and I stepped away. Um, I feel like it's just important to know that like I have bipolar disorder and a lot of trauma. And so I feel like over the last couple of years, um, as I started becoming like this, this figure, you know, like this person, uh, I felt like I had to like prove to myself that I was this person. And I think I went a little too hard, which is why I just stepped away really respectfully from everything. Um, I have nothing negative to say about anybody or anything that was involved whatsoever. Um, but my mental health just really needed to change the way that I've been living. But uh, I started uh, getting tattoos, doing trade work. So I, if you were a tattooer, I would message you and be like, hey, do you want some pictures? Because I want some tattoos. And you would be like, hell yeah. And so you would tattoo me, and then I would trade you a photo shoot. And that's how I started getting tattooed. It was just like this evolution. Um, and through that, I met a lot of really gross like really gross men specifically um and so when i met Kay, who i co in the tattoo shop with hot mess nation on the gram followers shit um i just really liked her i liked the way that she talked about her clients i loved the way that she tattooed i loved the way that she cared about her clients and like just the integrity that was there and the respect and so she mentioned wanting to own a tattoo shop then i only worked three days a week so i said hey i'll i'll be your business partner 
And I just kind of threw myself into it. And we actually met because she wanted to do a trade session. And then I got pregnant. So then a year later, we finally did it. But that was it. Honestly, it just kind of snowballed. And then, um, you know, being like a kind of hands-off shop owner was not enough of a challenge for me, obviously. (laughs) And I noticed that like laundry is a big thing. Nobody has necessarily their favorite place to shop when it comes to my clients, at least. And so I just kept saying, like, I want a cool place for, like, sexual healing. Like, more than just lingerie, I want a place where you can come and, like, learn about sex. I love talking about butt stuff. I love talking about orgasms. I love talking about, like, the stuff that a lot of people don't get to. And I get to do it at shoots all the time, but that's only three days a week on a small scale with people that happen to have the money for it. So... I decided that I wanted to open a store where you can, like, heal sexually and be cool as fuck and vibe with weird people. And we did it. And it was really fun. Um, But I'm tired. (laughs) Stepping away has been weirder than opening anything. It's been harder, too. Yeah, I thought for sure that, like, I was never going to be able to walk away. I don't have to set boundaries that well for myself. And then when I decided, like, I just need more time to human, it's... It's hard. It's important. Yeah. You gotta be a human sometimes. <laughs> you gotta shake up your meat suit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and and your, your shop here uh, was uh, a good place for people who are plus size, and it's been very welcoming. Yeah. And you had uh, an art. Uh, how, how would you describe that? So, uh, a couple things. One, we went up to size 6X, which is awesome. Um, but there were a couple things that even were like very stretchy at a 6X. We've never had a body come in that we didn't have something for. They didn't always like what we had. That's valid. Um, but we've always had something for everyone. And then we also, so I'm, uh, I'm a witch. <laughs> I do witchy shit. So I opened a spell jar bar where you could come and create a custom spell jar for whatever you wanted. Uh, so we built the big herbal apothecary and my best friend and I, she's the person who ran the spell jar bar and ran the store while I wasn't here. And so she and I just made a bunch of spell jars together and learned how to like stay grounded at work and stay in that space and how to hold space for people. Then we also allowed artists to sell their art off of the walls for free. Cause I just, you know, I remember it was like to be a young artist wanting to show my work really bad and having fucking nowhere to go. I couldn't afford shit. So we let artists do that for free. And then we also opened a free art supply closet right behind us. And that is exactly what it sounds like. It's a place where you can come in and we got big bags if you want a big bag and you can just take a shit ton of art supplies. And it started with just what I had. And then we put the word out on social media and people flocked in to donate more than people came to take. It was so cool. Like the community was just so like absolutely I know what it's like to be an artist, too. People were bringing in stuff brand new, stuff that they had. People were bringing in, like, garbage bags full of art supplies. And we were just able to put it up. And every day we saw at least three or four hands take full things. And it's so cool. I do tend to hyperfixate where I go from, like, oh, this is my hobby this week. And now next week I'm a knitter. And then next week I want to get into resin. And then this week I want to do this. And so... It's really cool. Yeah, right. I know you know what I mean. So I wanted to just give people an opportunity to be able to like hyper fixate, but for free. And I think we've really done that. A couple of people have learned how to fucking knit, oh, wow. which is awesome because there happened to be knitting needles in the closet one time, so they jumped on it. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know you had stuff like that. I've seen all kinds of paints and yeah. uh, chalks and yeah. stuff like so that. So that bag down there is actually full of uh, yarn right now. Just totally full of it. Brand new yarn. That's incredible. That's a really cool thing that you guys uh, did. Yeah. We've had a couple days um, where there was this one artist who is amazing, and she came in and just loved our shop, and, you know, we just loved her. She's fucking awesome. And so she brought her easel in and just sat and painted on a Tuesday, like, just while while everyone was shopping around for their dildos, she just (laughs) painted her little people. It's really cool. Yeah, it's awesome. And we have sold, I mean, I would venture to say we've probably sold over $5,000 worth of art off of our walls. And that was at no cost to the artists. All they had to do was put it on the walls, Dang, which is really it's cool. It's a great opportunity. Yeah. 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 And I always told people, um, I gave them about three months of free rent. It's not that I'm going to charge you after that. It's that after three months, if it hasn't sold, go ahead and take it elsewhere. So, yeah. yeah. Really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I ask how has uh, being a mom impacted your career? Ooh, um, being a mom's hard. 
yeah. And being a dad. Yeah. Being a being an adult around children is hard. Shoot, being an adult in general is hard. Period. Being a human can be hard. This meat suit, man. I get it. But you know, being a mom, it means that I have to be done with my shoots by two thirty every day to pick my daughter up from school. Which okay, so the way that I do shoots, by the way. We start at 10 a.m., we knock out hair and makeup, we knock out your full shoot, I edit it completely, and then you get to see the photos, and you're out my door by 2.30 with your photos in hand, album ordered, ready to go. And so I had to get that shit down pat, because I couldn't be gone every night. I have two kids at home that want to hang out with me, and um, that's part of why we're closing the store, too. You know, I got like a weekend away with my husband for the first time ever last month. We went to Las Vegas, and trip balls and had a blast and had like a kid free weekend it was cool as fuck (laughs) and then I got to like come home and realize like oh shit I missed that a lot I missed like shaking out the old meat suit (laughs) so yeah I will say that you know it teaches you how to categorize your time really well and how to use social media for marketing and like for your community and how great it can be while also simultaneously staying off your phone because you have to play Mario and you have to get chicken tenders ready by five o'clock or else the two-year-old will walk in the door screaming. Um, so just like I learned how to balance a lot and yeah, this was, <laughs> was <memorable. laughs> Kids are good. Oh yeah. Oh, also I have that lovely thing now where like my daughter gets to tell people that her mom takes pictures of butts for a living. <laughs> And I have to just be like, yes, that is what I do. But we can say faces. We can just not <laughs> specify. We can just say I take pictures. Um, and then teaching her a lot about why you can't take pictures of kids' butts because that's not allowed, Waverly. Um, and so having her just grow up in a weird space, I don't know what she's going to turn into. <laughs> we'll see. Right. I'm sure it's raising her is creating a, a person who's very... Uh, self-aware and uh, you know not afraid of who she is I guess her body and she knows boundaries and all the things you're talking about I'm sure it's being instilled into her at the same time and then at the same time you have this five-year-old that is just like doesn't care at all yeah like I teach her like how to love your body and how to feel neutral about your body (laughs) and she's just like mom stop talking about bodies it's weird and I'm like oh but you're so perfect and beautiful and wonderful and she's like Mom, I want to go play Barbies. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm excited to see who she becomes. You know, being raised by a, a weird-ass, strong-willed adult is going to turn her into either uh, the coolest motherfucker on Earth, or she's definitely going to prison. One or the other. Probably the first one. I fucking hope so. I swear. Um, yeah. So, do you think that the editing process or the actual picture-taking process is... Uh, more challenging and more rewarding and has that changed from when you were getting started and yeah. still learning stuff versus now when that's you know really more what you're question. doing that's a really good question so um, I do not use photoshop for anything outside of like the weird sun flare effects <laughs> so like my goal is never necessarily to make you look thinner or larger than you are but a camera and angles can absolutely make you look not like how you look. And so, Has that been your policy from the get-go not to use Photoshop? Um, not necessarily, no. I think that that came as I started to just like feel a little more like understanding of my abilities with the camera and like learning angles and posing and what I'm doing. Um, and then also like, you know, getting my own securities in check and not projecting on people. I was never necessarily a heavy Photoshopper, but you know, I used to do like some little things here and there. Right. Um, but nowadays, like, getting things right in camera is so fucking cool. Getting to show somebody a back of camera shot that you have no qualms about, that you're like, I nailed this shit and they're gonna fucking love it. Like, that is so cool. And that came with time. I feel like I've been doing that for about four or five years now. There was about one year where I photoshopped. It was like when I was in college and first starting out. And I thought, like, if you're good, that means everyone has to be skinny, Uh, which is just not for me. But, yeah, so learning how to nail it is so cool. Um, And now editing is more just, like, to keep things on brand and on style for me. I do more, like, tonal correction than anything. And that just came with time. I don't think there's anything wrong with Photoshop. I I think it's different to say, like, 
I don't Photoshop people's bodies versus I don't use Photoshop to edit my photos. I think like one is like a core belief and one is just, I don't have the time for that shit. Cause there's some amazing photographers out there that use Photoshop to really like change their photos into something amazing. That's just not something I have the time to deal with. It's like a creative tool more than a yes. touch up tool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also I think if you're transparent with your clients and you're like, Hey, I use Photoshop do you want this photoshopped? And they're like, hell yeah. And you're like, hell yeah. Then that's just like a big green flag for me, you know? Yeah. For me, it's just not what I do. But like I said, like learning how to get things right in camera, it's for me as a photographer, it makes me feel like a badass. Like I feel so good at my job when I nail it and like the lighting's right and this is right. And then I just get to slap a preset on it and roll. I think that's cool as fuck. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Editing can be hard though. Sometimes like you just, <sighs> I'm sure you understand this, right? You take the same picture in the same lighting of the same area and the same thing, and the first day you think that edit is amazing, and the second day you think that edit is trash, <laughs> and like it cannot look consistent no matter how hard you try. So that's kind of the challenging part, I think, is consistency. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, how do you deal with that when it's, is it, are you saying the same picture, like one day will look good, and then the next day you take a second look at it? Um, not so much. So like my studio, I shoot in the same spaces, obviously, because it's my studio. And so like today versus yesterday, yesterday it was sunny and awesome. And so I put somebody in the same place, and it looks so good. And then today it's kind of rainy, so I put them in the same place. And then I go to edit, and it's like, now she looks murky, and I have to like change things up a little bit. But I only have 45 minutes to get this whole thing edited. So you just have to like learn on the fly how to color correct. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it's a fun challenge. For sure. Do you think that it, it, this is a job that anybody could do? Yes and no. I know a couple of introverts who are so fucking good at their job. They are so fucking good at their job as photographers. Like they are just outstanding in their field. But I would just hope that they would never hear my client experience and think that that's what they have to give to people. Like, I have crackhead energy, and I'm always at 100. Um, and if I try to stop myself, I'll just cry. So, like, there's no point. I'm, like, a wind-up toy, and I just have to let it go. So I think that anybody can do, as long as they love it, absolutely, they can do it. But I think that you just have to learn, like, what your voice sounds like as an artist and as somebody that empowers people and it's okay if that voice is quiet like you don't have to be this big huge personality and you can totally be like type a and organized and like by the book to the scripts um it's just about like learning how to let your vibe and your voice and like who you are as a person kind of come out through what you do um i also think that you need uh, a little bit of thick skin um, not necessarily that people are like me do by any means, but, um, you know, it's, it's a competition. Like we were talking about at the beginning, like it's, yeah. it's not like sports where I get to prove that I'm very good. I just have to hope that I am. Um, and so you have to accept that like, you're so not for everybody at all, especially not as like artists, you know, when it comes to like wedding photos, people are so picky. They're like, I only want natural light, this kind of look. And like, I can't provide somebody else's work. Um, and so you have to like have some, uh, like a little bit of self-assurance, I think. Does that, yeah. that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. Cool, yeah. You know, and if somebody comes at you and says like, they hate your work, just like block them and move on. You don't need thick skin like to deal with people. <laughs> Nobody's like that mean. And if they are, block them. Um, yeah, I think most people could. I don't think everyone would love it. That's what I keep thinking though. Like, yeah. I just think that it's, it's weird. You know, like the hustle is so not for everybody by any means. So. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. It, yeah. it does seem like, uh, is it hard sometimes to balance work life? Oh, yeah. I don't have a work life balance. Like, yeah. it doesn't exist. I have a little bit of set time uh, in the evenings where I cannot be on my phone because I have my children to, like, love and take care of. And then my assistant and I have really set rules about work time because she's my best friend and my full-time staff and my full-time assistant. And my basically business partner. And so, you know, we have to like, sometimes I just need to send her memes and she can't talk to me about these things and vice versa. I don't know, it's just hard. It's yeah. super hard. Like trying to, 
hustle and be that person and post on Facebook and do the things and I'm going home after this and building a new set and doing all of this and I don't know I think it's great that I love it though because if I didn't love it it would be I would be burnt out like when I was on vacation in Las Vegas I was just so ready to come home like I was so bored I just wanted to go to work you know like work is cool and vacation was just like yeah this isn't really for me I want to go back to my friends yeah that's it's cool you got a job that makes you feel like that yeah and that's something that a lot of people don't have oh yeah I've definitely like curated this little like bubbly world somebody messaged me the other day asking uh something 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 do I know any men who something 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 and I was just like I know like three men that I see on the regular and outside of those three men I don't think I know any. <laughs> like I literally have like my girls gays and they friends and that's like it so that was weird really created this weird little gay bubble yeah did you see your life going this way as a kid fuck no <laughs> fuck no uh it's like I was so poor I had no money <laughs> like we grew up and I was raised in a trap house, uh, surrounded by meth heads. Like, I was super shocked that I made it to 18. And then all of a sudden I was 21 with a, a baby. I was a single mom. Um, Waverly and I moved into a spare bedroom of a friend's when I decided I was going to do photography full time. I just, I was so lost. Um, and as a kid, I wanted to be a musician. <laughs> and... I don't know, I, I don't think I really saw a future. I like had hopes and dreams, but you know, I had um, parents that did not believe in artists. My dad was very much like, artists can't make it anywhere without school and traditional training, and we're too poor for you to ever try to become anything like that. And I thought that I would probably be a waitress. I thought about maybe being an art teacher because I thought it was the closest thing I could do. And for the most part, I thought that I was going to probably just fall into the cycle like my family was um so breaking out of that was really weird and intense yeah that makes sense yeah what would you tell yourself if you could go back in time and talk to um young Mackenzie yeah so I'm in really intense therapy <laughs> I have been since uh October so going on like eight months now so I don't know how time works <sighs> Um, and yeah, therapy's been awesome. It's also why I've stepped down from so much, you know, I've gotten rid of that like desire to prove to myself that I'm as cool as the world thinks I am and instead just allowed myself to be, which is really cool. And so in therapy a lot, we go back and we sit with young Kenzie and I think the biggest thing that I would do is I would brush her hair and I would take her out for dinner somewhere just a little fancy, but she would not have to wear anything. And I think that I would just listen to her. I don't think I actually have any advice for her. I think I would just be there. You know, I think that that's really what I needed when I was younger was just the people that showed up for me. And so it would have been really cool to be able to be that for myself. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Go therapy, go. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> yeah, Jessica. <laughs> and that's something that's come up a couple of times as I've done these interviews. Uh, I was talking to the mayor of Lake Station, Indiana, a couple of weeks back, and we were talking about how he's... Mayors. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <fuck. laughs> Trying to do all kinds of different jobs. I'm out here talking about acid in Las Vegas. <laughs> well, that's dope. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> uh, but we were talking about how he, he's uh, been on antidepressants yeah. and therapy and stuff, and so that's, that's really important no matter what you're doing the, and finding what you need and what helps you and being the best version of yourself and being able to be the best version of yourself so that you can... Yeah. Be the best version of you for everybody else in your career and Absolutely. Your family. Absolutely. I think it's it's mental health is so fucking important. Oh yeah. And you know it's something You've always been an advocate of that. Yeah. I, I really respect that. I've always been really fucking depressed, so <laughs> that helps. Really? Hey. <laughs> Uh, I was on antidepressants for a long time and nothing worked for me. Um, then I was diagnosed as bipolar this year and we learned that I was bipolar because we tried an antidepressant that is uh, very bad for people with bipolar disorder. And, uh, it was Wellbutrin. And it just, and I'm sure there's other bipolar people that it works just fine for. But for me, unfortunately, it resulted in like a, you know, a fun little weekend laying on the couch wrapped in a blanket like a burrito hoping nothing touches me and just crying. And so I had to go off of that. And that's when I started therapy and I started microdosing mushrooms. <laughs> and I've been able to just like, 
use therapy in lieu of antidepressants, which I don't necessarily suggest for everybody, but medication after like something so scary like that. And I tried a couple medications in high school too that again, like, just didn't line up for my brain. And so finding um, microdosing on mushrooms has like changed my fucking world. I finally feel like neutral and grounded for the first time in my whole life. Uh, and I've been doing that, it'll be a year next month, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so I, I swear by that and then therapy and that person. <laughs> Absolutely. This conversation's taking some turns. <laughs> Nobody calls CPS on me. <laughs> I guess the the last question I have, um, which we've kind of touched on throughout this interview, but um, I like to ask everyone who I talk to, have you ever been bullied and what advice would you have for kids who uh, are dealing with that? Yeah. Um, but like I said, I think, I think throughout this last little yeah. bit, we've had several good advice points and stuff. Yeah. Bullying for me started at a really young age, bring it personal. Um, I was five years old when my stepmom at the time forced me to go on a diet and started talking about my body. And just like, I mean, I was five years old learning how to count calories. And like having a five-year-old now, like first off, what the fuck? Secondly, what the fuck? Um, I would never tell my daughter like, you need to eat healthy. Like you're the adult, you don't have to buy sweets if your kid is eating a lot of sweets and like using food as like some sort of thing you're allowed to like look at their mental health and assess it and like figure out better healthier routes than that um and then from there you know in school I was bullied really hard we were really poor and I was so weird I was so weird um and then in high school I was bullied significantly by this dumb motherfucker well, I won't name his name, but bet your ass if I see him in public, I'd do snicker to myself because he's a douchebag. Um, but that's my ideas. <laughs> you know him if you saw him for sure. Um, but he bullied me specifically for looking queer. I had short hair, and he would just go on about like, "You look like a lesbian," and I'm like, "I am fucking gay, bro. What do you want from me?" So all of this to say, um, to anybody that is like experiencing bullying. Um, I know this is the worst advice, but you're not going to fucking lose much from punching them in the face. <laughs> you're allowed to stand up for yourself. Uh, you're allowed to walk away. And if somebody doesn't respect your boundaries, I don't know, man. It sucks. Playing that, like, tough card doesn't always work. Therapy's amazing. And try to remember that no matter what anyone says about you, like, at the end of the day, we are who we are. And those people are also struggling and suffering. And um, the ones and twos <laughs> is a good one to learn. Man, I wish I had a better answer. I, I don't know. What would you say to people that were being bullied? Uh, I mean, I, I think you gave a good answer. Okay, and, cool. Um, yeah, I, I think a big thing is knowing that that's not going to be forever. Yeah. You know? and, and I mean, that there is bullying as oh my God. adults. But, but no, it's so different. Yeah. People nowadays are like, you're weird, and then they never talk to me again. Like, I'm not stuck in a classroom with them or right. at home with them. Like, I I can create the life now as an adult, and so that's the better times are coming, y'all. As soon as you get out of high school, that stuff, it really does dissipate dramatically. Right, and, like, and you're stuck in a building with people who may or may not like you, and if they don't, you know, you don't really have a choice but to go five days a week and deal with that. And deal with them eight hours a day, in yeah. and out. And I know, like, at work, it still happens. That's something I'm very fortunate to not know much anymore. I was always the weird person at work, too, but, I mean, I just worked in my home. It wasn't like it was, like, my core, you know, and I was, like, a server, yeah. so it's not like I had a ton of time to interact with assholes, so... Keep fighting, friends. <laughs> you are, you're almost out of there, I promise. Definitely. I think after graduating, you, you found yourself even further yeah. and uh, blossomed into all this. Yeah. And oh, also, another piece of advice. If you're weird as fuck and your friends are weird as fuck, hang out in your weird as fuck tribe and, like, show up for them. And, like, if you're loud, be the advocate for them. Um, and if you're not loud, allow your friends to advocate for you, too. Like, your weird little gang of friends is really cool. So stay, yeah, stay I, real weird. I think that's that's great advice. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I've said before, like find your communities yeah. and uh, the groups that lift you up instead yeah. of 
bullying you, making Absolutely. you feel that way. Um, but I think you've created with your Facebook group and everything you've done, yeah. uh, created that community for so many people. Yeah, I agree. I think that it's it's hard to be weird. It's real weird to be weird. And a lot of people, like, as adults, I think it is really hard to make friends. Like, really yeah. hard. I mean, we go to work and, like, I don't know if you're, like, I was, when I worked at Applebee's, like, the people I talked to the most were, like, 50-year-old women <laughs> and, like, weird <laughs> random people that I never hang out with outside of work. Um, and so it's been cool to have a community where we, it, it is like having, like, a big friend group. Like, everyone's sitting at the cool kid table. And I think that's really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Um... Well, if I can ask one more question. Yeah, ask <laughs> away. This Usually is that's fun. my last question, but um, we, we I don't know if we work together at Applebee's, but we, we both worked at Applebee's. We were really close. <laughs> and you... then we both worked together at Bob Evans. Yes, I remember those days barely. I was very stoned <laughs> yeah, back then. Different times. <laughs> oh but... my god, I heard a story about myself recently, and I've been telling it. Um, I, I'm kind of a personality now, yeah? And this girl was talking to her friend's mom, who I worked with at Applebee's, or not Applebee's, the Steak and Shake. And I worked there from 17 until 19. And this girl was like, oh my God, you know Mackenzie. And she was like, that girl's stupid. And the girl was like, what do you mean? And she was like, I don't know what's wrong with her. She could not remember a thing. She was always super weird. She was super dumb. And the girl was like, I just don't understand. That's not you. And I had to explain that back in the day, all I did was smoke blunts before work <laughs> and remember nothing. And I just thought it was really funny. Like, I was so fucking weird back then. And there's this poor woman that just has to remember me as the most annoying, <laughs> awful co-worker she's ever had. You know, it's kind of interesting. Isn't that hilarious? The different times people knew you and how they're, that may impact how they view you forever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Even oh, yeah. You're, you're so much different than oh. you were a year ago, let alone... Let it be known that I also thought she was dumb. I, I was in total agreement with Cheryl, 100%. But, uh, all right, yeah, so your question. Let's so, go back to our Applebee's days. Right. Uh, my last question was, how does being your own boss uh, differ from working for other people? So, um, it differs in every single way, 100%. Absolutely. The hardest thing for me to unlearn was a 40-hour work week. Uh, I was a server, so I mean, at my peak, I worked full time or like 30 hours a week at Applebee's. I worked 20 hours a week at H&M. I had my own photography career I was growing, and I had an, uh, an apprenticeship. And I had all of these at, so I would have been 19. I was a fucking child, you know, working 80 hours a week, thinking like, this is what I have to do just to survive in an apartment in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And then now it's like I'm allowed to only work some hours. I mean, I shoot like from 10 to 2 every day, so that's four hours a day, only three days a week. And then like I don't have to fill all 40 hours of a work week with work necessarily. I'm allowed to schedule my posts and just exist in my real life. Um, and I think that was, it was weird for me to let go of the 9 to 5 mentality. Uh, I just, I really thought that I had to do that. And especially like my assistant, even she's experiencing it. You know, she went from working full time in a retail management position to working independently for me, but she sets her hours. She can do whatever she wants. And so like learning that you don't, like you can show up for yourself dramatically and not work 40 hours a week just because other people say that's how to do it. Like you don't, you don't really have to. Yeah. So that's, I think that's a really cool thing that most people don't get. I'll say you don't have to deal with like the assholes anymore. Which is cool as fuck, dude. I don't have to deal with like the stupid men. No offense to the men listening, but y'all know how you are sometimes. <laughs> oh gosh. We all worked with some of the men at Applebee's yeah. though. We know what they're like. Uh, so it's cool always being like the weird coworker. Now I'm just like the only coworker. It's just me and V and we're both super fucking weird. And so it's it's cool. You get to like really get to grow like as like your true authentic strangeness strange okay. um and we were talking recently about how like I don't ever have to like put that mask on at work anymore so I don't come home from work exhausted because my mask was off all day I don't have to like pretend that I'm some normal functioning member of society because I'm I'm not I'm a weird fucking member of society and like when I was in Las Vegas there was a couple points where I'd be like acts like a human <laughs> and um, it was really cool because I was able to like find other people that like we got to stick together and all of us felt from the time we met each other like oh thank god I get to be me around you and that's something that you get when you're self-employed like you just get to be you yeah well that's an excellent yeah. point to end on I think 
Sorry if I was too weird. <laughs> oh no, you were great. I appreciate all your time and your insight and uh, everything that you do. Like I said, the, the community building that you've been able to do is really great and helpful for so many people, I'm sure. And yeah. uh, it, especially something locally, we haven't really had anything Can like I this, so. shamelessly plug my next venture oh, real quick? absolutely, yeah. We're starting a slutty circus. Oh, really? Yeah, I made friends with this amazing person. Um, I always describe Danielle as if, like, when I met her, it was like I found that another part of me was walking outside of my body. And she is just so cool. Um, she's been doing pole professionally for years and years and years. Um, on, like, actually just, like, a year and a half longer than I've been doing photography. So we're really good at our jobs. And she's been teaching pole. She started teaching me pole. And then I fell in love with, like, burlesque and circus stuff through hanging out with her. And so... Um, Hopefully by the end of the summer, you guys can come attend our slutty circus. Uh, we're looking at the name Two Violet Circus Co. Because my middle name and her middle name are both Violet. Oh, wow. And, yeah, isn't that awesome? Yeah. So, yeah, guys, uh, follow your weird fucking dreams. And if you want to start a circus, go meet circus people. Start a fucking circus. Find someone with the same middle name. Yeah, exactly. There's no such thing as coincidences. Isn't that wild? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Channel's closed. Definitely, yeah. Check that out. Closes one business, opens a fucking circus. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you're, you're always doing something. And I know, right? Interesting, right? It does. It's, I don't know how to be bored anymore. I've been able to do so much, especially since the pandemic. Like, you just make weird art and do weird things. So I'm yeah, really like, excited. My grandma always used to say, if you're bored, that means you're a boring person. Yeah. That's, that's one thing no one can accuse you of. You Nobody know? could <laughs> ever. Oh, my God. I don't remember. I think the last time I was bored, I was in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> that's so weird. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's also not a common experience, probably. <laughs>